Welcome to Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Well, a little different look today. We're actually going to take a car on a test drive and the campus is closed so there's no traffic. This is a good opportunity to do it. We're looking at a 2011 Cadillac DTS with 56,000 miles. Now, everybody runs into this, Brian. I mean, what are we looking for? There's going to be a ton today. This is a really good show. Yeah, it's absolutely a great show. It's going to help you get the most of any used car investment you're going to make. So we got to start with the, some of the most important things first, brakes. Yeah, let's see how that does. Is it going to stop or is it going to make any noise or what's going on? Ooh, got a, a little, little bit growl of there. there. Yeah. Ooh, Could be a rotor. Noise. Yep. Could be a rotor. We need to look. Did it pull either way? No, it didn't pull too bad, but I had a little bit of pedal pulsation. But the key here, Brian, is listening, feeling, smelling. You know, you're feeling for any kind of twisting, any kind of steering, anything like that. You know, it's easy to get swayed emotionally on a really nice car like this. It's got truly a Cadillac ride. It's got Cadillac style. It is so nice inside. The creature comforts are incredible. All the power amenities appear to be working. You know, you want this car. Now, there's a clue. Ooh. Looks like we've got some inspection on the brakes to do. Yeah, sounds yeah. like the rears, but you know, it's tough to tell. A test drive is a critical piece of the puzzle. I mean, we have to know what's going on, and we would have never known that. The brakes could look brand new. That could just be glazed, Yeah. maybe a little bit dirty. I mean, there could be all kinds of issues. Once we get it back in the garage, we're going to get a good look at the tire tread, see if we got any feathering, any strange wear patterns on the tires. Could give us an indication around struts. We've got suspension components worn. But, I mean, generally speaking, it feels pretty tight. Watching you drive it, it sounds pretty tight, <clears throat> but I love the fact that just one test drive, this is our first one in this car, we got the groaning that does sound like from the rear. Yep. That's great, because now we can make a better mathematical decision. If that's something we can repair, then we should negotiate that as part of the deal. Well, I would say that was a pretty successful pre-sales test drive, wouldn't you? You'll recall that the only real concern we came up with was that groaning sound, we think from the back, at low impact, low speed braking. So, we've got the wheel removed so we can get a better look at that whole system. Before I pulled the wheel, I checked the wheel bearing, 12 and 6 o'clock, no rocking, no clunking at all. That was rock solid. John's going to show you how to do the same thing up front. But, I ran a Carfax on this before the test drive. Now that's key. Run it before so you have some bias, some lens to look for problems. The Carfax said that it was rear-ended a few times. Looks like lightly. There was no airbag deployed. Nothing catastrophic showed up on this report. But I do know there was damage done back here and it had to get repaired. So before I jump into the brake repair, I want to take a look at a couple obvious things. The lines where the doors meet the fender. That's all pretty uniform. There's not a lot of big gaps there where panels meet panels. That all looks pretty good through there. But what I'm really interested in is up underneath, all of the suspension components and links, is anything twisted? Does anything look irregular? Does anything look concerning? And really, it doesn't. Everything looks like it's right where it's supposed to be with no twists, no bends. So again, I think it was non-catastrophic damage, but worth your time to look while you've got the wheel off. So this is gonna be a little bit atypical brake job. Everybody knows how to replace pads and rotors, and we may have to do that. But the reason we're working on it this way is we think that groaning is telling us we've got some glazing on the face of the pads and maybe even a little bit on the face of the rotor. So before we throw a bunch of money at this and replace it all, which we could do, I wanted to check the thickness of the rotor. I check it. It's fine. We're good. We're within spec. And if you look at the meat left on the pads, there's a lot of life left there. So I really don't want to throw these away just yet. So I'm going to show you how to pull the caliper off and we're going to get access to these pads and what we're going to do is resurface the back of the pads. There's a disc brake quiet spray you see sitting right there. Essentially creates a rubber barrier on the back of the pad. That takes the harmonic vibration away. No more groaning. At least that's the theory. So let's gently pull this off. Get the caliper off. We're going to use our bungee to hold it up in place. Real gentle here with all the clips, keep everything fully intact. Dadgummit. Okay. Come up here. We're gonna use our friend the bungee cord. Come up in, grab a bite. Strap this up out of the way. No obvious damage to that caliper as I look at it. 
everything looks pretty good there. Let's get a pad out and see what we can see. So I got a feeling we might be able to work with this. So there's the back of the pad. We're going to clean that up. Most importantly, that's where the glazing is. Look at that. It's obvious glazing on that pad. So what I'm going to do with both of these pads, put them on a piece of sandpaper on a level surface. So you're not going to create any divots in there. Work it gently. Take a look at it. Work it a little bit more. Take a look at it. You can see that glazing starting to disappear. We're not trying to take a whole bunch of material away. We want to get our coefficient of friction back by getting a nice clean surface here. So that's pretty good. That looks almost like a new pad. Let me hit it one more time. And that looks really good. So we're going to do the same thing with the second pad. Let me wipe down the back here. And give you a good look at what we're going to do. This is the disc brake quiet spray. This is going to create a rubber barrier, a couple passes. You've probably seen these. You probably recognize the color. I like to get it uniform. Don't drag the pad through it. Okay, I'm going to let that dry. Do the same thing on the back pad, on the back of the caliper. And we're going to put this back in and see if we do it on both sides, if we get rid of our groan. i got a pretty good feeling this is going to solve the problem. We'll find out together. Stay with us on Tech Garage, brought to you by rockauto.com. Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com, is being brought to you by Borla, the world's most winning exhaust. Evapo Rust, super safe rust remover. And by rockauto.com, all the parts your car will ever need. Welcome back to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Now I'm taking the wheel at 12 and 6 o'clock and I'm not getting any movement in that wheel bearing. That's a good thing. Brian was talking about that. You know, we really didn't even hear any noise. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come under the suspension here. And when I come to the suspension, what you're going to do is pull and tug on any of these suspension components. And what you want to look for is anything moving or shifting. You know, suspension, steering, shock, struts. A lot of that's just a matter of tugging and pulling and looking for any precipitable movement in there. If you don't see any, we're in good shape. I don't see anything here. But if you did see some, take a look at this right here. I actually have a wheel bearing, and you would hear some noise with this one for sure. Some hums. Turn it to the right or left. This thing pulled all apart. That's what's going to happen eventually. Once again, costly the repair. Shocks and struts, you're looking for any leakage here. You're looking for any movement or any kind of play in there or any rattles. You don't want any of that. And then our suspension components. You know, we were out there, we turned to the right, we turned to the left, we hit some different articulating roads on there so we could hear any bumps right here. You can see this one flopping around. That's what would make that popping noise. The bushings in here would be worn. We would see any of that. We didn't hear any. We suspect the suspension's in good shape. Now, when I was making the suspension movements and checking it, I noticed if I run my finger along here, the whole North Star engine, there's oil all around the oil pan here. You can actually see it starting to seep down. It's not pouring out, but that's what we were worried about because the North Star engine's infamous for that. That, water leaks, blown head gaskets, stuff like that you have to look out for because the cost may start to get a little costly and exceed the cost of the car. We don't want to do that. So we want to factor that into our repair. Now, checking for these leaks, a lot of rules have changed. You guys all know the color of transmission fluid, usually red, oil's looking like this, but this is new. It'll be a lot more dirty than that. But then we're talking about coolants. You have some coolant leaks. Well, there's all different types of coolants out there today. There's the regular coolant we're used to, and that's that green color. Everybody's familiar with that, and that's what we're looking for. But keep your eyes open, because some Asians or imports are using this, which is a purple looking color. Once again, coolant, but yet a coolant leak could get very costly, or we're dealing with our Cadillac with some Dexy coal. So not only do we have a neat art collage here of all different colors, we have different colors of coolant we have to keep our eyes open for. Also, you have the blue fluid here, which could just be fluid leak in maybe a five or $10 container. So we're talking about thousands of dollars worth of repairs versus $5 worth of repair. That's why Brian said keep your eyes open when you're looking at this fluid, we're smelling, we're actually driving along, we're checking for all this. Now, this is pretty cool. So if you look at the graphic on the screen, we're looking at a 172 point Cadillac checklist. Now, what is that? That's what it goes through when it goes through a certified pre-owned car, you buy a certified pre-owned car. Now that goes through the vehicle history, 
Brian was smart enough to do that. He actually got on the Carfax and he looked at the history of the vehicle. They do it as well. Maintenance items, how's the maintenance been? Tire checks and pads, we did that. Detailing, road tests, so important. We took it on a road test. The functionality of all the components, the engine compartment, under vehicle, interior, and exterior. And then if it's a hybrid vehicle, they'll go into those tests as well. So this is a 172 point checklist, but you can get out there and just do an abbreviated version of this and do what we did, look at some of the tests. Now we're also obviously gonna go under the hood and check the oil conditions and stuff like that. We'll actually do that today on Project M&M. We're gonna check the fluids and that's coming up shortly. But you wanna go through it all. And the cool part is we just go down to Rock Auto. We actually got a gasket kit. I think this one's a winner because we have the ability to fix it. We'll go ahead and reseal that. We got the brakes done, we'll take it out. I think it's a keeper. But you know what? Make sure that you do those checks because you don't wanna end up with a wolf in sheep's clothing. That's not a good thing. We'll be right back with more Tech Garage right after this break. Welcome back to Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. Well, Project M&M, the Mercury Makeover is back in the shop. You're probably wondering, why didn't we check the brake fluid or the power steering fluid when we changed the oil? That's kind of normal. Well, if you remember, the car's been sitting for two years, so we knew we were gonna flush the system. It's probably bad, and if that's not evidence enough, let me show you this. This is really, really cool. I got this at rockauto.com. This is a brake fluid tester, and what this actually does, it checks the moisture content in the brake fluid, and this one's unbelievable. I checked a little bit earlier. Watch this. Stick that joker in there. Man, I'm all the way up to four. Red's bad. Green is good. This thing's bad. It's full of moisture. We need to get the fluid out of there. Tom, what's the best way to do that? There's a bleeder valve at each corner that I'll just take off and, and let the, uh, the fluid drain out with gravity. It'll take some time, but we'll get most of it out. Then when we install the new rotors and pads, we can bleed it properly, get the, the uh, system completely full of fresh new fluid. So I'll move to the back now. Whether it's drum or disc brakes, you gotta bleed each corner. Now there's two good reasons why we're actually changing that brake fluid. The first one is, like Tom said, it could become contaminated. You know, some people they put transmission fluid in there or it just comes contaminated with different chemicals that get into the brake fluid. Now what does that do? It actually deteriorates the seals and you can see them right here. I got a cutaway of a master cylinder. And what you have is a primary piston and you have a secondary piston right here. Now these seals, this is what holds the fluid in the high pressure chamber versus the low pressure chamber. So just think about this for a minute. If you're pushing your brake pedal down and these brake fluids all contaminated and ate away at these seals, what's gonna happen? It's gonna bleed by this high pressure chamber and it's gonna go into the low pressure chamber and your pedal slowly gonna go to the floor. That's reason number one. Now reason number two, it's hygroscopic. Well, what does that mean? It absorbs water. And when it absorbs water, Tom said that lowers the boiling point and that brings us to our fluids. Now you got different choices in fluids as well. You got dot three, dot four, dot five, and dot 5.1. That's a lot of different fluids, but what you need to know is dot five is silicone silicone base that used in special applications dot three dot four and dot five point one are all glycol based but the higher the number the higher the boiling point so what you want to do is you want to put the brake fluid in that matches or exceeds the number that we're dealing with Tom we got to turn our attention to the power steering fluid I mean that uses fluid as well right and it's not just the simple rule that Ford's took type F transmission fluid and, and GM and Chrysler took one kind of fluid there could be different fluids for different years model years there's different fluids for hundreds Hyundai and, and GM and all the different brands now, so you really have to check and see if you have the right fluid for your vehicle. Yeah, definitely, and it's also a fluid, so it's gonna break down over time. Now we can get it out of there, we can use the suction gun and we can get it out of there. You can show us what you're doing. Yeah, and just repeatedly suck it out, and then once we, uh, we get it out, we can put new fluid in, and then we can uh, get the air bubbles out by turning the, the wheel from lock to lock repeatedly and that should uh, r remove most of the, the air in the system. Now you can do it that way or we can go ahead and remove the actual return line, crank it over, pump it out. Why are we doing that? Well, if you look right here, this is pretty cool. This is a cutaway of a power steering pump. And today, Tom, the tolerances are super clear inside of there. I mean, they're tight. I mean, 
old pumps, you could get away with some rough fluid. Today, you can't. They're vein style pumps. So when this thing goes around, little centrifugal force is going to fling the veins out and that debris is going to get caught up there. You're going to ruin a pump in a heartbeat, not to mention a racket pinion or a gearbox. You're putting all that fluid through. So it's a good idea. We're changing ours. Now, another thing we want to do is, like you said, bleed it. Now, that's important, too. We'll bleed the brakes later when we're talking about that. Stick around when we get down to doing the brakes. But you said you can turn it from stop to stop. That's going to aerate the fluid and get it all out. That's a good thing. We can also use a vacuum pump. I can put it right in here, and I can pump it up, run the car a few times, and this is going to suck all the air out of there. It's a new method, but it works really, really well. What about those hydraulic pumps? Well, yeah, we hear on new cars they have electric power steering, so you think, oh, well, hydraulic fluid's gone. Well, a lot of them are electrohydraulic, so, so there's an electric motor that powers the pump versus a belt. So you still have the fluid you need to change periodically, and, and we can look in the catalog and see how those look. The different, the, there's fully electric, there's, there's a hydraulic electric mix, and, and they, the systems have been around since the 90s. It's really nothing all that new, the electric hydraulic systems. Well, let's go check it out at rockauto.com. Well, we changed our brake fluid and we changed our power steering fluid. But you know, some cars don't even have power steering or electro power steering. How can Rock Auto help us there? Well, yeah, there's lots of different variations now. You may have electric power steering, but it's actually electric pump assist uh, pushing hydraulic fluid around. Right. So, so you still have hydraulic fluid to change. We did a rockauto.com newsletter. We did an article on this and, and showed some examples. He, here's a, a completely electric rack and pinion for a Toyota Prius where you have electric motor there on the rack. And then scroll down a little bit and we have an electric, the system's completely electric, but the motor is actually on the steering column. Yeah rather than down on the rack. Well, Tom, this is a bit scary. I mean, I'm turning my car. I have no mechanical link to the steering whatsoever, you know. They use torque angle sensors up there to how fast you're turning. But, you know, we've been doing drive-by wires for years, you know, and people don't even realize it. There's so much fail-safe built into that that this thing actually has less of a failure rate than actually some of the linkage is going bad. Yeah, it's actually been around quite a few years. The last one I have here is for a newer Ford F-150, you know, large vehicle, and you have a big electric motor there on the rack. Imagine that takes a few amps to turn to the left or to the right. <laughs> Here's an example. This is the Toyota MR2 electric power steering pump from the early 1990s. Wow. Where it's, it's pushing hydraulic fluid around, so you have hydraulic fluid to change. So, it, yeah, it's uh, different variations of electric power steering have been around, been around a long time. Well, that's awesome, Tom. You have all the options there. Well, stick around. There's plenty more Tech Garage when we return right after this break. Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com, is being brought to you by ZMAX, the one product for your engine, transmission, and fuel system. AP Laser, leading the way. And by rockauto.com, all the parts your car will ever need. Welcome back to Tech Garage, presented by rockauto.com. Well, one of our favorite segments, the real deal, the video question of the week. Had a headlight bulb go out or the new one and replaced it and it's still going out. Brian and John, maybe it's an electrical problem. Can you help me out? Jose, hang in there. This is a common problem, but we can show you exactly what you need to check in your driveway and diagnose it properly. Yeah, we actually have a simple board here. This is pretty simplistic versus some of the new lights today we'll look at in a minute. But if you look at this graphic right here, we're talking about a pretty easy schematic. It just kind of comes down, goes through some lines. You got a high beam and you got a low beam line, and then it all goes down to ground. It's pretty easy. You can see the right headlight, the left headlight. So what we're going to do is we're just going to pop ours out of here. I'll grab this headlight and I'll pop it out of here. This is a sealed beam headlight because it's all one unit right here. So if I pop this out, what we're gonna do is just reach behind here and unplug it and get it out of there. Now, according to the schematic, we have a black, a brown, and a white. It's all right there, or a light green, that's perfect. So Brian, if you go down to the bottom one, which is black, yep. and don't block this meter here, let me get that there going. Go. There we go, right. go up here to this side over here. Check this. And our meter showing 11.86. What's that telling me? Well, it's telling me you got power to the low beam. Low beam. So if I go back to that one and go to the other one, I'll switch it to high beam. And there it there is on is high beam. Volts. Okay. So in that case, you got voltage going to the light bulb. You could have a couple of issues. I mean, yeah. it could be over voltage. Yeah. You could have a ground. You got a short to ground somewhere in the line that's creating a load and burning up your new bulb. You yeah. know, that's an old school system. Modern day, we've got capsules now. 
This is a composite headlight system. It's still the same. There's your two posts in there that you want to check. You can still do the same test right there in your driveway. Quick tip, don't touch the bulb. They're halogens. That's don't right. get any oil on the bulb of that one. That's right. Evolution came up with these two. Yep. Yeah, these are kind of old school. So here we go. Two posts right there. You would check. Yep. Easy enough to do. And another old school, you can see the terminals right there. Now, new school, you may be dealing with HID, high intensity discharge. Now, this is really cool because if you look right there, you see that? That's a ginormous arcer, man. 600 volts to spark that thing just for a split second. But the cool part is once it gets lit, it barely burns any electricity and it glows that nice bright white glass. You know, now we're talking about LED technology. So we even went a little bit further. Yeah. But Jose, you know, if you got power going to your headlights, you're good to go. If you don't, Yep. On the higher low beam, now it's just a matter of start tracing the schematic back. Back through. Yep. Yep. And the more diagnostic work you can do with a really good meter. Anybody yep. can do that. Well, John, these are all really good diagnostic skills that we practice for this problem as well as on the used car today that anybody can do. Just take your time and do it right. Now, you're a real master when it comes to risk mitigation. And, you know, what'd you find for us on the car? What should we do? You know, I like to know exactly what I'm signing up for. So here's our top 10 list. You showed us that awesome 172-point checklist from Cadillac. Well, we didn't have that kind of time. We didn't have that kind of tools to do everything we needed to do. But here's the top 10 from the brake inspection and service. We saved 400 bucks because we determined we don't need that. We found the oil leak. That was a biggie. We did our research. That's $2,000 of cost to fix that thing. Let that show up in your negotiation on the used car deal, right? The tires were good. That's $800 we don't have to spend. You can see the whole process. We looked at electronics. We looked at the exhaust system. That could be a biggie. Think O2 sensors. All of that was good. Yeah. We scanned for codes in case there were any that weren't showing up yet. There weren't any. So all in all, pretty good deal. We avoided about 4000 potential $4,000 of surprise expense after buying the car just by doing a really good pre-sales inspection. Now, for me, the car's worth it. A technician, you know, we go in there and fix these problems, but this is a great way to determine, hey, do I buy it or not? You know, even Rock Auto, they have a little cost comparison on their website. You can look at the carts, cost of the parts, and you can do it that way as well. Yeah, it's an awesome tool. Yeah, it's an awesome day today. I mean, they need to find us during the week. Yeah, absolutely. Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, we're there. We love hearing from you guys. Keep your questions coming. Yep, and don't become the wolf in sheep's clothing. Remember our sheep? All right, now I got a little investigation to do this week to try to find out why this thing was in your dressing room. But I'll tell you what, we'll be back next week with more Tech Garage presented by rockauto.com. You're killing me, man. You're killing me. Production assistance for Tech Garage is provided by Chipola College, located in Mariana, Florida. Founded in 1947, Chipola was recently ranked as one of the top three community colleges in the United States.